This is the Morning Swim Show, and I'm your host, Peter Bush. Occasionally on the show, we like to look back at some of our memorable interviews. And today, we'd like to show you an extensive chat with swimming legend Mike Troy. In this interview, the two-time Olympic champ relives his experiences of swimming at the 1960 Olympics. We'd like to bring you the Ready Room, where we talk with people who have made an impact or are making an impact on the sport of aquatics. Today, we have with us... Mike Troy, who's the Olympian, uh, gold medal Olympian in 1960 Rome Games. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Brent. Pleasure to be here. Let's, let's take it back to 1960, the Olympic trials. You're, in Indian you're training with Doc Councilman in, in Indianapolis, and uh, you just set the world record, 214.1, in a 200-meter butterfly in the prelims. Gosh, I wish I hadn't said that. It sounds so slow today. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, set that in the, in the prelims, and uh, it actually broke my own world record um, at the at the trials. And uh, it was kind of a scary trials for me because uh, Doc was convinced that I would make the team easily, and he was spending time working with some of the other guys, and I probably needed a a hand on my shoulder. And I was kind of real nervous and everything else. It was probably one of the poorest races I'd swum in about two or three years. At the time, only two went on to the Olympics, and later it went up to three advanced Olympics, and now we're back to two. That's correct? That's correct. Yeah. That, the pressure was really on for you to perform. Yeah, it really was. Uh, uh, I think we also took two for Pan Ams at the time, too, but that was considered, uh, uh, you know, I would say less, less pressure on the meet, but it was, it was tough. You only didn't matter what you did in the past, as it should be. Whatever you're doing today, you make the team or not. Yeah. Well, uh, other things were different. Too. Did they have, uh, was stopwatches still being used or did they have electronic timing systems? No, they were using stopwatches and they were experimenting with some uh, uh, finish type guesstimate methods. Uh, electronically, you mean? Well, yeah, they had a tape that they'd run through and it was uh, devised by O. Max Ritter, um, who was a tremendous swimming supporter. And uh, each lane had a, the same length of cable. And when, they, when, you, when you finished, one of the judges would push this button, which would punch a hole in this large tape as it went through a reel. And that would help to show where you finished. Uh, uh, so they had one giant reel going. Yeah. And, and, they, they had and the guy said they're winding, it, winding the reel. So if three or four guys were coming in together, they'd wind it fast. And if there was nobody for a while, they wouldn't, they wouldn't run it because it was not uh. automatic. It was just, and that was experimental. So, no, that's Max Ritter. That was Max Ritter, okay. yes. And, uh, and then they just pull the tape out and find out which, so which, worked, which one yeah. was punched first. Worked, and which, which hole got punched in which order. Second, third, fourth. Wow, that's amazing. And the big fight was they wanted to make sure uh, that each cable, whether it was a lane one or lane eight, had the same length of cable. So there were all kinds of uh, very early wires. Stages. Oh, yeah, very early, yeah. very early. Well, and, and back then, there was a no, I mean, false starts. I mean, you can take, what, up to three or so? Yeah, that was irritating because you'd go down and you were ready to go. And... Uh, you know, somebody had false start in lane one, and then you'd get back up and false start in somebody two ago. And you were, I think you were allowed to take, gosh, I can't remember, I think you were allowed two false starts. You couldn't go on the third, so you might go in to throw people off and then wait for the good start. So you really didn't get a great start uh, because you're always sure that this is not going to count. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. All right, so then you, you have to come back that the evening. This is from the finals. Right. And uh, over in one of those lanes is Lance Larson. Right. Okay, and uh, he takes it out almost a body length ahead of the field at the 100. Did, was he in your radar? Uh, well, you got to remember we didn't have goggles. So it was a little hard to, to spot somebody. You just checked out your peripheral vision. And uh, Doc had convinced me a long time ago not to look at where they are. Don't look on the turns, don't look at somebody. He said, they're not helping you in practice. Don't help them in a race. And uh, I really focused on my own swim. I wanted to make sure I do uh, I was usually ahead at the 100 mark in the 200 meter race, but not the 50. But in this particular race, I was uh, probably in fifth place at the 175. And I'd been so nervous before the race. I was sweating and shaking, and I was feeling I was having chills. And you know, it was, it was hot as could be in in uh, Detroit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, well, you I, came back two thirteen yeah. uh, two yeah. new world record again. Yes. So there you are. You made the Olympic team. What's going through your head right then? 
I was just a relief. It was such a relief to have that out of the way. And uh, uh, I also swam the 800 free relay, but I didn't have to. Uh, anybody who made the team could try at Rome for a swim off to make the to make the spot. So we took six guys for the relay, plus anybody who qualified was eligible to try out for it. Well, I didn't want to be one of those guys that was selected because I'd already made it in the fly, which would open up a spot for maybe another Indiana guy to uh, get on the spot. We'll talk about that 800 free because there's an important figure there that was also on your team, Jeff Farrell. Oh, yes. Jeff Farrell, the story is uh, six days before the Olympic trials, goes into emergency surgery for an act, uh, appendicitis, favored to win the 100 free, doesn't make it, loses by a whisker, and then... Did an open turn. With an open turn. He did an open turn because he couldn't flip. He just he came in and grabbed it. He's all taped up. If you've ever seen the pictures, he was taped yeah. above and below the suit. And we wore pretty big suits then. Mm -hmm. You know, he had the big bozo, uh, what they use for drag suits now. And he had tape going below his suit and tape above it. Uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. He, well, he, he had to make top five in the 200 yes. free, and he did. So he's on the 800 free relay. Right. What emotionally, what's going on with the team right then, seeing those type of efforts and then, uh, you know, overall? I think everybody wanted to see Jeff make it. And uh, for the U.S. team as well as for uh, for Jeff, and he's a very likable guy. And um, uh, you just, uh, you thought that, uh, how can anybody be this tough to come back and summon? And when they, when they called him to their mark, so when they, when they said, take your mark, he just barely bent over like this. He couldn't bend. And he swims down. He gets there first. He does a grab turn. Oh, my God. You know, come back. He actually placed better in the in the prelims than he did in the finals. And well, back then, been, too. Yeah. You got the flat start. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and he's probably doing a, a yeah. deep dive, which is probably <laughs> foreshadowing now yes. whether it was Absolutely. using. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, okay. Now you're boarding the plane. Uh, the Pan Am American flight to Rome, you know, the European, uh, well, at that time, uh, Australia and Japan pretty much dominated swimming. Yes. And uh, on the women's side, all the Dutch uh, women had every European record except yes. for the breaststroke at the time. What was the general sense when you're on that plane heading to Rome? Uh, it's funny. George Breen said... You know, this is this is going to be one of the most exciting times of your life, but there's going to be a lot of disappointments as a member of the team when you see how poorly you are treated. And we were. You know, we went over on a prop plane, and the officials went over on jet. And there are tons of stories about things that happened in the village. And I think it was probably some of us who came back later and uh, wanted to make some changes within U.S. swimming years later to help the athletes get on, uh, get more of a say and more fair treatment. But everybody was excited. You were, you know, you, we, we could have uh, gone on a boat for all I cared. I was on the team. I didn't care. So you didn't, uh, you know, you didn't, didn't think about it in terms of the fact that you were on a prop and somebody else was on a jet. But there was a lot of electricity with uh, everybody on the plane. And it was strictly, it was all U.S. team on the plane mm -hmm. at what, the time. What, now, how are you mentally preparing for this race? Well, um, it's kind of a long story, but uh, at uh, at our pool, Doc had put a picture on the wall uh, from a newspaper showing the Olympic medal. And I'm sorry I didn't bring it today. I wish I had. But uh, it was a little larger than life picture, so the medal was about this big in the picture. And it showed the front and the back of the of the medal. And it was on the bulletin board. It was yellowed at the pool. So I'd look, go and look at that every day. And I kept saying to myself, you know, that medal is mine. All I have to do is go there and claim it. Okay. And I, I kept saying, visualizing over and over again, the medal's yours and, and you need to go claim it, which was a great challenge in practice because you also ask yourself, when you were doing a set and you were really tired and maybe you didn't want to go the next one butterfly, you know, I might do, I'll go 200 free instead of 200 fly on this one. You thought, that, is this all it takes to get that medal? I mean, surely there might be somebody in some other country that's doing all of his set fly and you aren't. And so it was a motivation for me to get that medal. 
I visualized it so many times, I knew exactly what the medal looked like. And I even got to the point where I said, my name is engraved on that medal, on the side. And beautiful script, much better than I can write. It said, Michael Francis Troy. And I could see that in my mind very clearly. And this was not only motivational for me, but it made me work to the goal that I had established. And I always say to myself, is this all it takes? Is this all it takes? Is it taking more? Is somebody else doing more? And uh, uh, at, at, at the games, when I got the medal, um, it was kind of funny because um, when they put the medal around my neck, and it was on, it was the first time they'd ever given the medals on a chain. Before that, you just got the medal. And the medal we'd seen on the bulletin board, on the newspaper article, was just the medal without the oak leaf chain around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took the medal and I looked down at it. I'm trying to see where my name was. <laughs> and it wasn't there. And I was kind of chuckling. And it was right before they said to play the national anthem. And I'm giggling because my name is, I knew it was on that medal. I had seen it every night in my mind. And somebody asked me after, what were you laughing about on the orange stand? I said, uh, long story, I'll tell you later. But uh, that's, that was part of the visualization, visualization mm -hmm. process that I went through. You, you've conv you convinced your subconscious so Absolutely. much that Absolutely. this was going to happen, you just had to play out. I role. just had to, don't make any mistakes. Yeah. Do it right. You had the world record. Had it for almost four years. And uh, had really only lost one major race, and that was the Pan Ams to Glanders. Uh, but did not lose my world record. And, what, a, what, a, what a great story. You know, and, and there's other stories there at that same Olympics. I mean, Bill Mulligan came out of nowhere and won oh, the 100 breaststroke. We thought he was nuts. <laughs> he kept saying, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. And we were thinking, yeah, you know, Bill, we almost didn't take a breaststroker. We took a breaststroker for the 200 breast. He swam the 200. They didn't have 100 breast. And we were, they took a, uh, Paul Haight went for the 100 for the relay. And they debated as to whether or not we would take a 200 breaststroker because we were so poor in the breaststroke. And he won the gold. And he would, they were sitting down, the photographers would come by, and he would say, Hi, I'm Bill Mullick, and I'm going to win the breaststroke. And, and he said, I want to meet the Japanese guys because they're going, they're going to be swimming with me, and I'm going to win. And I, I was embarrassed for him. I thought, God, Mullick, how can you say that? And he was so sure he was going to win that he... He psyched out all the other press truckers. Oh, we loved it. It was a wonderful story. Wasn't he using the same, same visualization that you oh, were doing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All his affirmations were, absolutely. were right there, too. And, you know, I, years later, when I got involved in coaching and we started doing, uh, they would say, okay, we want to have these visualization things for the swimmers. I just assumed everybody did that. I didn't, uh, maybe I just, I was very fortunate that my thinking process was the same as what they were trying to teach our swimmers. And I just stumbled on it by accident. And, uh, uh, you know, when they, when they said, well, you need to visualize this, you need to tell your swimmers to visualize it, and I thought, doesn't everybody do that? So I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate with that and very fortunate to have been in Doc Councilman's early, yeah. early, early groups. Very good mentors. He was a tremendous, oh gosh, he was a tremendous guy. Well, the, you know, there's other stories there at the same Olympics. And before your race in the 200 fly, Lance Larson had, had his controversy, which he uh, swam the 100 free. And the timing system at the time, I don't know if it was Max Ritter's timing system or whatever. Yeah, I believe it was. It yeah. was. There you go. Uh, $100,000 invested in the system. It showed that Lance Larson won it, and they overruled it, and it went to the gentleman from Australia. Yeah. Uh, I think it's John Devitt. Devitt. Uh, did that motivate you? Oh, it pissed everybody off. I bet. And, uh, you know, nothing against Devitt. You know, the, he didn't make the decision. But it was like the officials turned their head and were, they didn't want to, nobody wanted to make any kind of statement to say it was this and that. They threw out the timing. Larson had faster time on the watch. The judges on the side said that he, he won it. And this tape thing said he won it. And, uh, but David came in and threw his head up like this at the finish, and his photograph looked like he possibly won. Well, those are tricks. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And uh, Larson was, 
was wonderful. He was so insane. And he was, uh, he swam butterfly on our medley relay later. And he was, uh, and uh, I guess uh, Neville Hayes swam butterfly for the Australian team. And uh, we weren't expected to win. And Larson's saying, let me swim freestyle. Let me anchor it against Devitt. And he's up there, and, and poor, they dove in. When he dove in butterfly, it was over. Larson just went insane on the 100 fly for our leg of the, of the relay. Mm -hmm. poor, uh, poor Australia was out of it at that point. But Larson was screaming, it's my medal. I want to race Devitt. I want to race Devitt. I want to anchor the relay. Yeah. And, uh, what an exciting time. Everybody, everybody was fired up about that. Well, <clears throat> when you look back, too, you set the world record at that race at the Olympics, never shaved. No. Never shaved. No. I, uh, I wouldn't shave my legs. I just, uh, Still if, I, if I, oh, I would, <laughs> if I were swimming today, I would do it. Hmm. And, uh, but uh, at the trials, there were only, uh, at the U.S. trials, the only guys that didn't shave uh, that made the team were uh, McKinney, uh, Summers, Green and myself, the four Indiana guys. We didn't shave. Everybody else had shaved. And it was, I just, yeah, I remember we were standing there in the pool after we'd made the team. We were working out, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Larson was saying, you know, you got to shave, you got to shave. And I went, why? He says, well, it, uh, the hair makes the bubbles cling to your body. And we were standing there, and I looked over him, and he's got bubbles all over him. And I didn't. And uh, we were training. We, we made the team when we were training before we went over to Rome. Mm -hmm. And I said, you got more bubbles on him. And, then he's, mm -hmm. and about a half hour later, he says, yeah, but the bubbles make you slide through the water faster. <laughs> well, I shaved uh, in 1972 when I was coaching. Um, the kids were shaving down for trials. My team, I had two kids make the team that, uh, in 72. And they... They yeah, were uh, Mike Stan and uh, Mike Stan and Kathy, Kathy Carr, Carr, both uh, both mm -hmm. gold medalists. And the kids convinced me to shave. I said, "Okay, I'll shave one leg for you. I'll shave it." Like so, I'm <laughs> kind of the shaving group. The whole when I climbed into bed that night, I thought I was going to slide out of the hotel. <laughs> I thought I was going to go right out of the hotel. You're looking for bubbles. <laughs> but I thought, man, if I had to do over, I would. There's no question, I would yeah. shaved. Yeah. You retired from swimming in 1962, and you must have felt a real loyalty to the country because you joined the navies. The Navy yes. SEALs. You became a Navy SEAL. Right. And uh, you had experience in Vietnam, and you served in Vietnam uh, all the way through, what, 67 or so? 60. I was a, yeah, in Vietnam, and I uh, extended for a year, uh, and I was a SEAL team instructor for a year, so I did. I was in for five years. Well, uh, word has it that you were a legend even there and then with the Navy SEALs. It must have been a great team experience in that regard also. It really was. It was. It, it paralleled my experiences in swimming because you worked in small groups and you got to depend on the other people just like you did in practice when you, for instance, if you were tired during a set and you wanted to bag the next one and somebody would say, come on, do one more, do one more, come on, you can do it, come on, you can descend these, you can do. And it was that same kind of thing. The esprit de corps was very high in the teams and uh, uh, it was an underwater demolition which evolved into SEAL team. and. Uh, it was, uh, it was a 14-year-old boy's dream come true until they start shooting back at you. So uh, other than that, it was a lot of fun. Well, then you go to Coronado in 1967. You're a trainer there, but you start getting back into coaching. Yes. Was that a hard decision? Well, I didn't want to be involved in coaching, but the uh, commanding officer of the base, his daughter was on the swim team, and he <laughs> asked me if I would like to coach. And I said, no, thank you, Captain. I really am not interested. He said, well... We, we went back and forth a couple of times, and he says, let me put it this way. I am your commanding officer's commanding officer. How about coming down and giving it a try? And I did, and it was just, you know, got right back in, and that same electricity. You just, you share their, their victories, and you share their failures. And uh, it was very, it was very motivational. I loved coaching. I loved it very much. Well, and you were successful at it. You became yes. a national team coach, a Pan-American coach, coach Max Stam, uh, Kathy Carr, and... Matt Biondi, yes. 1984. What common traits do you see through all those athletes? I think the very hard work ethic was part of it. And I was from old school. And uh, uh, even though uh, the practices that we did at that time are nothing compared to what they do today, 
at that time, in the, in the 58, 60, 61, 2, etc., we were doing more than anybody else was. So, uh, relatively speaking, it was really intense. And then I trained that in my swimmers to the point where we, and we looked for consistency and constantly tried to uh, swim their own swims. I want to teach them that, that you, know, you have to swim your own swim, but ignore the other people. And uh, there was just a high level of, uh, of wanting to succeed. And uh, I think that, that pays out in, in uh, the rest of people's lives. I think swimming is a wonderful sport. You don't have to count on four other guys or, or 11, 10 or 11 or 9 or other guys to, to uh, as a team sport. You do well or you don't do well. And you can swim, uh, and I saw this in the athletes and I felt it myself when I swam. You could, you could swim 100 free 100 times in competition and never win, but you always can improve. And I think that's a tremendous thing that our sport offers is only one person can be number one at any time, but everybody else can be a winner. You know, I, I started off, mm -hmm. my time was a minute, and now my time's 52. Well, all of those little successes along the way teach you that you can succeed in other things in your life. And I think mm -hmm. that's a tremendous thing. Well, you're touching a lot of lives now because you have a swim school. Yes. And thousands of kids are coming through your swim school. That must be rewarding also. It is. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun to see those, the expression on the child's face the first time they blow bubbles or the first time they get to go down and pick mm -hmm. up something off the bottom. And they, you know how it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're just, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and they look over at mom and they hold up the little float <laughs> that they did. And uh, yeah, I can be in a, in a not so nice mood at times. And I go in and teach a class and I come out, I'm 14 years old. It's just so much fun. It really is a treat. Well, I think a lot of our viewers probably think you lost your voice because of all the coaching through the oh, years. I've uh, always been a mild mannered, soft spoken <laughs> guy. But the reality is, you just you're you got your own challenge right now. Just recently, you had major heart surgery. Yes. They replaced the aorta valve. Right. And uh, six, six, seven months later, you look great. And although the voice has been a part of that um, that process, you look great. Well, I feel great, and um, it's. Uh, the, the valve they replaced, uh, fortunately, my arteries were all clean. And he said, you know, your arteries are in great shape. And, uh, but the valve uh, was bad, and it was pushing half the blood, and part of that was coming back, so I was exhausted all the time. Uh, it paralyzed, the operation paralyzed uh, one of my vocal cords. But uh, I look at it this way, I'm on the right side of the grass. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I don't mind uh, being soft-spoken for a while. Mm -hmm. My former swimmers, I uh, say they miss my yelling, mm -hmm. but um, so yeah. I'm just a soft-spoken, easy-going guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, I would think that the challenge of recovery and taking this on, you had to go back and look at different points in, in your time of your life, different things. Where did you draw strength from to, to go with your recovery? I drew it from a lot of places. I, I think the competitive swimming, and uh, like I say, I I won the Olympic medal, I won two Olympic medals, but had I not won the Olympic medals, I certainly had loads of successes along the way. You have failures, but I had lots of successes, and you keep thinking, uh, I keep getting, I keep having these successes, I'm not afraid to go out and try something else. So that was easy to draw, and going through uh, like SEAL team training, was really intense. I was pretty sure they weren't going to kill us in SEAL team training. <laughs> and I thought, no matter how uncomfortable this is, you'll get through it. Just just don't go ring that bell. Because in, in the training, you ring the bell, you've quit. Mm -hmm. And I, when, I had, when, when I had that operation, and they just said, you know, you'll, you're going to be stronger than you've been for 25 years easily. And boy, yeah, I, could, I couldn't stand. The first day of physical therapy, I stood. It took two guys to give me up. My legs were just shaking and like this, and I thought, oh my gosh. But they said, you will do it. Just keep working. And I'm, I'm on the treadmill one hour every day. I lift some uh, free weights, and uh, it's a treat. And uh, I just knew you can do it. 
it's not going to be easy, but you can do it. And I think that in our life, we're all faced with those kind of challenges, whether it's the business we're in or, or, or uh, whatever it is you're doing. If you just keep going, you may not be number one, but you will get better. And keeping in mind that there's only one CEO of General Motors, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody else that's not CEO isn't a champion. And you just keep striving. You may say, I want to be CEO. You may never be that spot, but you won't be uh, CFO by saying, well, I'm going to stay here in a mailroom. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think those are things that swimming offers us that's been very important in my life. And yeah. uh, that and the humor. I like... Uh, I like having fun. I had, I had, uh, we had a, my coach, Doc Councilman, was everything, he made everything fun for us. And uh, I try to do that in teaching and in teaching with my swim school. We tell our instructors, pretend you're that three-year-old and you're terrified of the water. Make it fun for them. And I think the, uh, the teachers enjoy it better that way. Well, Mike, thanks for sharing your story with our viewers, and I think this is a good example of what swimming really brings to everyone who participates in the sport. Uh, you don't have to be a gold medal, to under, uh, gold medal winner to understand how to visualize, how to mentally prepare for things, but more importantly, that you constantly show up and, and be there. And I think Mike Troy embodies all of that. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's my, been my pleasure. This interview with Mike Troy, also available for purchase in our swim shop. You can go to the Ready Room interview page where we have almost 30 interviews from some of the best swimming and diving legends in history. And that's it for the show today. I'm Peter Bush reminding you to keep your head down at the finish.